Good evening. Welcome to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for the June 2nd, 2022. This time I would like to call the meeting to order. The commissioners who are present for this evening meeting are at City Hall. We also have staff from the City Attorney and Clerk's Office, as well as City Planning Department. Um, if you have any process questions during the meeting, please email cityclerk at meridiancity.org and they will provide a reply as quickly as possible. Um, nobody's online here, so uh, with that, We'll been, begin with the roll call. Is it Mr. Mr. Clerk tonight? That's for now, okay. yeah, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Commissioner Wheeler? Present. Commissioner Stoddard? Present. Commissioner Grace? Here. Commissioner Lorcher? Here. Commissioner Yearsley? Here. Commissioner Seal? Here. In absence, Commissioner Grove? Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Um, 10 mile public storage, which is file number H2022 0016, will be open for the sole purpose of continuing to a regular, regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, will be open for only that purpose. So if there's anybody here to testify on that um, tonight, we will not be taking any testimony on it this evening. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, and we have four items on the consent agenda. Uh, first item is to approve the minutes of the May 18th, 2022 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. We also have findings of fact conclusions of law for Amina's daycare, file number H2022-0012. <clears throat> 
We also have findings of facts, conclusions of law for Black Rock Coffee, H2022-0019, and findings of fact, conclusions of law for Peak at Sawtooth Village, H2022-0026. Can I get a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt this consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, this time I'll explain the public hearing process. We will open each item individually and begin with the staff report. Staff will report their findings on how the item adheres to our comprehensive plan and unified development code. After staff has made their presentation, the applicant will come forward to present their case and respond to staff comments. They will have 15 minutes to do so. After the applicant is finished, we will open the floor to public testimony. <clears throat> Each person will be called on only once during the public testimony. The clerk will call the names individually of those who've signed up on our website in advance. You will then be unmuted in Zoom or you can um, come to the microphones in chambers. You will need to state your name and address for the record and you will have three minutes to address the commission. If you have previously sent pictures or presentation for the meeting, it will be displayed on the screen um, and you or the clerk will run the presentation. If you have established that you are speaking on behalf of a larger group like an HOA where others from that group will allow you to speak on their behalf, you will have up to 10 minutes. After all those who have signed up in advance have spoken, we will invite <clears throat> any others who may wish to testify. If you wish to speak on the topic, you can come forward in chambers. Um, when you are finished, if the commission does not have any questions for you, you will return to your seat in chambers. Um, and please remember, you will not have um, be called on a second time. After all testimony has been heard, the applicant will be given another 10 minutes to come back and respond. <clears throat> When the applicant is finished responding to questions and concerns, we will close the public hearing. And the commissioners will have the opportunity to discuss and hopefully be able to make final decisions or recommendations to city council as needed. Um, so at this time, I would like to open public hearing item uh, number H2022-0016, 10 mile public storage for continuance. Commissioner Seal, I apologize. Yes. We have no sound out, so I'm going to reboot the oh. system. Okay. Um, there is nobody in Zoom, but it'll take a couple minutes to reboot. I think you're okay to do the continuance, uh, okay. but I want to get it rebooted. So your screens may flicker. You may get kicked out momentarily, but that's what's going on. Okay. So we can go ahead and continue for this part of it in chamber? Okay, good deal. <clears throat> um, the applicant is requesting... Uh, July 7th for the continuance, but right now that is during the, the holiday week of 4th of July, and it would be the only thing on the agenda, so we're recommending the 21st. So if anybody would like to take a stab at that. My yeah, turn. Yeah, oh. Yeah. All right. I'll just be loud. Well, that's, no, that won't work. Yeah, sorry. We'll have to. Sorry. Can you hear me if I talk? Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Okay. I'll take a stab at it. Go right ahead. So I, I, Mr. Chairman, I'd make the motion to move this agenda item number five, H-2022-0016 to uh, um, our regularly scheduled meeting on July 21st. Second. It has been moved and seconded to continue file number H-2022-0016 for 10 mile public storage. To the hearing date of July 21st, 2022. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, with that, we will move on to file number H2022-0006 for Jump Creek South, and we will begin with staff report. Recording in progress. There we go. Everybody hear me? Just one second. Okay, good evening, planning commissioners. Alan Tiefenbach, Associate Planner with the City of Meridian. Good evening. 
Okay, this is a proposal for the Jump Creek South preliminary plat. I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, this is pretty much more of an administrative process. Uh, so the, the property is three and a half acres in area. It's zoned R8. It's located at the northwest corner of West McMillan and North Black Cat. Uh, the comprehensive plan recommends this property for medium density residential, which is three to eight dwelling units per acre. So a bit of history on this property. There was an annexation, a preliminary plat, and a development agreement that was approved in 2014 for what was known as the Jump Creek subdivision, and this was part of the property. Um, what you're seeing on the left is the vicinity map that was done for the 2014 annexation. What you're seeing on the right here is the original preliminary plat as it was approved. Uh, this preliminary plat included uh, 80, just about 86 acres, and it was 300 in single family lots and two multifamily lots. So you see all the single family here. If you look up here on the northeast corner here, that is one multifamily lot here. There is another multifamily lot down here in the southeast corner. Uh, again, so this was 318 lots and two multifamily lots. Now, since that time, there's been six final plats that have been completed, and that's totaling 308 total lots. That includes uh, the first multifamily project, which is up here, again, at the northeast corner, and this was seven multifamily lots. Uh, the Planning Commission may remember, there was at least a few of you that were on Planning Commission at this time. In 2021, there was a conditional use permit for the first seven fourplexes. Those are fourplexes are required under conditional use, and that, again, was for this multifamily lot here. Uh, during the review of this project, it was discovered that Jump Creek number four, which was the plat that was intended for the fourplexes, was platted as individual lots for each fourplex, whereas if you look at this preliminary plat here, all of those fourplexes are shown on one lot. And I've sort of outlined that here to make this less confusing. So on the left was the original preliminary plat, where you can see the fourplexes on one lot. That's what I put here in red. The plat on the right is what was actually platted. This was an error. This shouldn't have been done, um, but this was platted out as seven lots. The intent was to have each fourplex on an individual lot. Uh, staff caught this mistake, uh, brought this back to the applicant, and the applicant conveyed to staff that uh, this is what they wanted to do, and when the next multifamily quad quadrant, which is what you see here, when that one is subsequently platted and built, they're going to want to do the same thing with that. It's going to be 12 fourplex units. Small error, the problem is, is that what this does is although the number of units and the number of houses don't change, it has brought the number of lots over what was the approved 320, so 318 single family, and to a multifamily lots, it would take them uh, an additional 20 lots over. Uh, the solution to this was staff talked to the applicant, and the solution was to plat out a new preliminary plat for the for the final phase of the additional 20 lots. So again, once, once you see it, when you see it here on the top, this was the approved preliminary plat for Jump Creek. Uh, what you see on the bottom here is what's being proposed, which is the new preliminary plat for what is being called Jump Creek South. Exact same number of lots, exact same number of open space. Nothing has changed. Oh, sorry, exact number of, yeah, same, same number of units, same configuration of lots, same configura configuration of open space. The only thing that has really changed is that all of the fourplexes are now being platted on individual lots instead of one. Uh, it's important to note that under our present code, uh, the, because this, this parcel is only three and a half acres in size, they would not be required to provide the uh, common open space. However, the Jump Creek Development Agreement, the one that was originally approved for this, has this in it, and all of the open space and the amenities are all included as one package. So even though this is now a new separate preliminary plat to account for that plat error, uh, everything else would be governed by the same development agreement. Uh, with that, I would stand for any questions, and or I have uh, finished my presentation. All right, would the applicant like to come forward? For the record, Kent Brown, 3161 East Springwood. And uh, I, Alan's done a great job uh, presenting it and understanding what's taken place. Um, 
the same number of units, if you will, because when you have multifamily, those fourplexes were accounted for in that original design. The only thing is, that's taking place is that instead of those multifamily fourplexes being located on a lot, now they're on individual lots. And um, so we, we had to be somewhat creative in how we did that. Uh, the final plat that is spoke of in your staff report uh, has a lot that matches the configuration of this preliminary plat. Um, so the services and everything else are being installed with that lot. Uh, there's, there's no right of way as a part of this. It's just a resubdivision of whatever that lot number was in phase six and uh, putting these lots in. I'll stand for any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant or staff? Thank you. No, seeing none, thank you. Uh, is there anybody signed up to testify? Mr. Chair, there were none. Anybody in the audience like to come up and testify? I don't think we have anybody online that I'm aware of. Okay, seeing none, no further testimony from the applicant. Okay, pretty straightforward. Unless anybody has any other questions, I will take a motion to close the public hearing for item number H2022-0006. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded to close the public hearing for item number H2022-0006. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Who would like to go first? Don't everybody get in here all at once now. <laughs> I mean, if, if everybody's kind of in consensus, this is pretty straightforward, more administrative, then I will certainly take a motion. Any big discussions? Okay. Um, after considering all staff and applicant and public testimony, I move to recommend approval to the City Council of file number H2022-0006 as presented in the staff report for the hearing date of June 2nd, 2022 with no modifications. No second? Se second. It has been moved and seconded to approve item number H2022-0006, Jump Creek South, <clears throat> with uh, no modifications. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. And then for the training, do we want to close the, do we want to go ahead and adjourn? for this evening and then do the training, or do we want to go ahead and make this part of the public record as well? Hey, Mr. Chairman, the, the training is listed on your agenda, so I would, let's keep the meeting in place. We'll adjourn at the end of the training sessions. Sounds good. So tonight we have training sessions, and the first one is going to be our Pathway Systems Overview. Good. Is this on? Good evening, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and give an overview of pathways. I know you've probably seen pathway conditions come in, so you obviously have an idea of how that dovetails into the development approvals process. Um, so I'm just here to 
um, I'm not sure how much I thought of it as a training, but um, just provide a broader context and a little bit more information about the pathway system. My name is Kim Warren. I am a licensed landscape architect. Um, now I'm kind of all about pavement and planning. Um, I'm with parks and recreation upstairs um, and actually work as much with the community development staff as, as my colleagues up there. So in terms of an overview of pathways, um, a quick, I'll speak quickly to this picture, is new pathway out at Owyhee High School. Um, I did have the opportunity to meet Andy on our recent pathways tour. I should say Commissioner Seal. That's, um, that's okay. <laughs> but I appreciated you attending. Um, every, once a year, in lieu of a spring park commission meeting, we take to our bikes and um, look at new pathways that have been built and do some arm waving, um, new developments, new opportunities. Um, it's been really fun the last couple of years because our system has gotten a lot bigger. So uh, we can actually ride bikes the whole time. We don't need a pickup and a transport to some other part of the system. So um, we're going on long rides and it's been fun. So we started at Owyhee High School this year. Um, but back to the overview. I'll give you a bit of history, um, and then just talk about the general framework and how the pathways system is organized um, in lieu of our aging master plan. We tend to use GIS to, as, as our plan for pathways. So I will give some information on that and also our process for keeping that current. Um, and then growth has been a big driver of pathway development, um, which is, it's a plus that I try to remember uh, when growth can feel challenging. So um, we'll talk about some of that impact and then a few city projects and, and kind of what our mission is in terms of in-house projects for pathways. So in terms of history and evolution, um, we would not have a pathway system if we didn't have a master agreement with the Nampa and Meridian Irrigation District. Um, irrigation districts historically have been difficult to work with, um, and this agreement predated my time at the city, um, but it's been a really valuable tool. Um, they've been a great partner. Um, once we got them to not say no, um, we worked out this agreement back in 2000 to establish some basic rules for uh, how we might share their facilities to build pathways. Um, and the value of this agreement is that we kind of agree once, it's a bit of an umbrella, and then any other pathway um, that gets permission to be built on their easements just kind of plugs into that master agreement so we don't have to renegotiate it every time. Um, I've also found that we see with their new pathways master plan and some other cities um, called a lot in the last year to say how how are you working with the district so it was fun to learn that meridian was a bit of a leader um, and so that agreement um, with the irrigation district um, you know it covers access and uh, we tend to get permission as to you know where we actually do build those pathways. Um, their concerns were largely based on safety, so um, we follow their rules. You know, if if they need a fence in a certain scenario, um, we will require a fence. Um, they, through this agreement, wanted to put all the responsibility on us for pathways, so we take it. And then we, in the process of getting easements or permission to build pathways, we pass um, some of that maintenance and responsibility through to developers and homeowners association. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about why later. Um, yeah, and there are various things like within the easements we can't plant trees, um, anything that gets in the way of their operations. So we try to respect their mission while still carrying out ours, and it's, it's worked pretty well. Um, it also protects the district. Um, there's a notion of recreational easement. It was a state law that was, the scope of which was enhanced. I won't try to speak to it, as I'm sure Mr. Starman could do a better job. There is some protection for owners who allow recreational facilities to pass through their properties, but this agreement just helped the district to feel even more uh, reassured. So um, I just like this quote. It's a bit 
punny, um, necessity is the mother of connection. And I think it's really true of Meridian. Um, we worked so hard to get the agreement that enabled the pathways because we don't have a river and a green belt and we don't have foothills, which are more natural open areas. What we had were linear open spaces along canals. So uh, we try to be really mindful and I do try to thank Nampa Meridian and just um, remind people that like, that is the spine of our system. Um, it's our, some of our best pathways, um, natural linear open areas. So after the agreement, before I got to the city, um, there was an original master plan document done. Um, it, was, it was just a hard copy. It was updated. When I happened to be a consultant on the parks master plan update for the entire system back in 2015, where we wrote a pathways chapter, the main goal of that, I think, um, in terms of um, sharing some responsibility for maintenance with those HOAs is we determined that you know we were going to be up to 130 some miles in the system and for the city to own and maintain all those pathways in perpetuity it was an incredible amount of labor and money and payment or pavement and we really weren't equipped to do that so um, the plan itself has a few details we still refer to um, I consulted um, the bulk of of what I work from as a planning tool and what I reference is um, the GIS plan itself. So the framework originally identified by that master plan had this basic connectivity concept. Um, I think of it, and I like it because it sort of sticks, it stays in your head. It looks to me sort of like running circle with a yellow belt of rail with trail. But the idea is a big loop of connectivity through the city. It's a little bit more of an urban setting. And then these canal pathways along the 10 mile creek and the five mile that, um, that intersect. And um, with that basic framework is the idea that from any neighborhood um, people would, we're working toward having safe routes or micro paths or ways to get on that system and have some overall connectivity. At the north part of the loop, um, so I guess I will say in 2015, um, there had been a history of, of paving pathways kind of wherever we could build them and had permissions. Uh, for a while they called it the spaghetti plan because it was a little bit chaotic. Um, and so as a part of the 2015 effort, it was decided to really try to focus pathway resources on just a few pathways um, with the aim of let's get some continuous smiles so it, it starts to feel um, more like a system that takes you somewhere. Um, so the five mile and the 10 mile pathways, sometimes they're known as the 10 mile creek, Pathways or Five Mile Creek, um, and also the Rail with Trail were identified as priorities. Rail with Trail is a really long game. Um, it's a wonderful idea. Um, I, I'll speak to that later if you like. Um, but it, that's a bigger effort, sort of valley wide. Um, and then we did identify these connections north to Eagle, Eagle Island State Park, the river, and the Greenbelt. And once we get there, we have a lot of opportunity to go far um, east west in the valley. So. We're working on getting north. Um, so this is a map. It's, it's the north part of our working pathways map that highlights the loops. And you can kind of see how they lay in a little bit more actually uh, within the city. So the pink, well, I guess to back up a little bit, the, and this will show on your maps. The symbology is just a little different. But the solid red lines are existing pathways. Um, the dashed line, orange lines here, and I think they might be dashed green on your handouts, um, those are proposed pathways. Um, and then the routes are highlighted, the, the loop in the pink color, the five mile pathway, which has, um, currently it has about five continuous miles, sort of starting from about 10 mile to the southeast. Um, so that's our biggest run. And then in the aqua blue color, the 10 mile creek pathway, which also has parts that continue further to the southeast. And then we use GIS as every department does. <laughs> it's such a great tool for planning and it allows us to keep things a bit more current. Um, so we have an adopted pathways layer and that really kind of functions as our plan. 
Um, it's available online. During the pandemic, I know many things became um, much more interactive online, and this was something um, that we did at. Um, it's, you can get to it through the Parks tab on the website, uh, just Parks and Pathways. Um, and if you, I think I have a pointer. Anyway, there, the map over on the right side of the screen is interactive. You can zoom, you can pan through that, and it will give you, um, you're able to get more detailed information. There are some links where you can print the Pathways map, more like what you have in front of you. Um, and then you can also get to those resources through the Community Development website. Um, through transportation and bicycle and pedestrian resources. So the adopted plan, it's law, essentially, that's incorporated into the development code. Um, that's what we absolutely have the ability to condition to developers. Um, but recently, um, in terms of keeping the plan more current and processes for updating, uh, GIS, um, worked with me, they've been great, um, to create an editable map. And it's really only the pathways layer. I am I wish I knew more about GIS. I know enough to know what a powerful tool it is. But um, this is kind of isolated so that I can make some minor changes and not mess anything up um, you know, further into the system. So because the adopted pathways layer is part of the code, of course, I can't just go in and make edits and change it as I will um, without process and public input. But um, we've added a layer to my map that's a working layer. So I can go in, and if a pathway was proposed and it's now existing, that's an easy change. It's not essentially changing the plan. So that's something that we will write to the final document more quickly, and just so the map stays a little bit more current over time. Um, and it also is really nice because we're just growing so quickly and out at the edges of the area of impact um, with, you know, when there are development agreements and annexations, um, we can ask for pathways, but it really helps to have them drawn in, even just like we want a pathway on the half mile, we're going to go along this waterway. Um, so it helps me kind of think about those connections. Um, and then every 18 months to two years, in fact, we're due. Um, I'm going to wait till after the budget hearings kind of wrap and, and get finalized um, in August, um, we will present a summary. Um, we present all the information to the Park Commission um, and usually do a workshop in advance of that and kind of talk about some of the bigger changes to the map and ask if any new changes are needed um, and ask for their recommendation to council. And then we also present this information to council so that the new updated layer can be adopted and it's more enforceable, sounds like a strong word, but um, yeah, it has some tooth to it. I know that as the pathway system has grown, um, people, I, you know, I actually get calls from individuals saying, um, when is the pathway in my neighborhood going to be built? So I think there's some momentum to it, and I think that holds true of the development community. They see the value, and um, there, there are times when we can say this is on our working layer, we can't require you to build this pathway, um, but we'd like it. And, and so it gives us some latitude to do that, even if we can't insist. <clears throat> it's been a good tool. And it's updated every couple of years. Um, private development really has constructed the bulk of the pathways. Um, I did put together some numbers for um, the mayor's office prior to the state of the city. And I think my estimate was four to five miles of new pathway built with development in the past couple of years. That's a just an estimate. Um, but yeah, that is a big engine to get things built. And I mentioned that um, part, of, part of that agreement is to have the pathways owned and maintained by the HOAs. Um, these tend to be in new areas of town, obviously, where development is occurring. Um, and it's happened quickly, um, which has been kind of fun. We do not charge impact fees for pathways. Um, I believe because it, it, se it's, we've been, it seems like a double dip, I guess, to say so you have to build this and then to charge an impact fee also. So to date, um, we condition the pathways. There's been some discussion about a change. But for now, um, that's the story. The pathway showing is along the Jackson drain. Um, there may have been discussion here. Um, maybe it was a council discussion about 
landscape and how that um, open kind of creek could be part of this development north of Pine. So city pathway projects um, are part of my responsibility as the pathways project manager. Um, they're an ongoing effort. I think we're trying to enhance connectivity um, and to a great extent lately we're filling in missing gaps. Sometimes we call them missing teeth. Um, and so we're working under certain criteria and those tend to be is it a part of town where development occurred before we had these plans or the policy in place for, for parks to be on the review committees to request pathways? Um, is the ownership of the property we want to cross relatively simple? So um, is it one owner? Is it an agency that we know we can work with? Sometimes we're in a situation where we would need to get 17 easements across that many properties to do a pathway and that's really hard to make happen. So we tend to not not put those into motion, they just don't happen. Um, and also we look at stretches that really don't have any chance of being constructed through development. Um, and we've had opportunities in the past to use like on this Fairview Avenue. Um, again, it, sometimes they're a bit unglamorous, but I love this 10 foot stretch of uh, sidewalk on Fairview. At the left of the photo, our five mile pathway comes in, it runs along the creek and it, it hits Fairview and it used to just kind of dead end there and nobody really knew if it continued. So now we have this section of sidewalk um, and the stripe on the five mile pathway is a new thing to where we, um, just to give it a little bit more visibility, this is a pathway um, or make people wonder what it is. I know one person didn't like it at all, but for the most part, we think it gives continuity to the, to the system itself and it helps provide a cue to people. Um, yes, this goes on and, and you can kind of see where, so they don't always have to be on a device. Um, so we started out, of, the last couple of years we've been focused on these infill projects and originally we started with a dozen and we've kind of windowed it down to the more realistic ones that kind of fit our criteria. Um, so I've got the projects keyed out, and I've mentioned a couple of times that we're really working to head north at, at Linder and Locust Grove. Um, so these are all projects within um, that are have been designed, or nearly designed. Some are out to bid and awarded. Some are just in the process of being awarded, but they're all going um, and headed into construction this season. Um, and I think one of the more, so we're heading north, we've got a small connection number four, just north of 8th Street Park, again, aiming to get neighborhoods down to the five mile pathway. Um, number five and that circle is a, it's a mile that really hasn't had any pathway in it. And the wastewater treatment plant is there, there's a little bit of pathway and then there's been nothing west to Black Cat. Um, and they were just owners that had owned farms and been there a long time, um, but suddenly that's changing. Um, Quartet is being developed, and we have a pathway project that and we're actually partnering with, partnering with the developer to build a bridge over the Five Mile Creek, um, and we're connecting essentially the, the neighborhood segment with the existing segment near Eustick and Ten Mile. Um, and that's a mile that's just been no person's land for a long time. So that will connect maybe three miles to the west of Black Cat with another five miles to the southeast and, and it'll be a really beautiful long run of pathway. <clears throat> These were also numbers I compiled just in advance of kind of looking at data for a state of the city. Um, so even the privately owned and maintained pathways are part of the public system, and I think you know that to get credit for qualified open space. Um, a pathway is a good way to do it, but it's a public pathway. Um, but you can see the relative, you know, 35 miles um, to city owned and maintained, maintained pathways, which is more like 15. And the city pathways would include 10 foot loops within parks um, and also the five mile pathway, that's one that we, it's such a major spine of our system and it ties into safe routes to school and so that is one we maintain as a city. Um, so around 50 miles, um, some of these are the wide sidewalks, um, some are asphalt pathways along um, irrigation features. 
Uh, and then another proposed 130 miles. So we've got a lot kind of out at the edges um, that could be done. Um, there's more here than I think people realize. Um, perhaps not you all, but I, I think people who aren't familiar with Meridian. Um, so we are working to just create a little more visibility and awareness. This is just a graphic I really loved from the strategic, I think it was the city strategic plan. I went to one of the workshops and I feel like people, people love pathways. I love pathways. I feel honored to do this work. I know I have a lot of support from um, my colleagues in community development. They've really got my back in terms of review. Obviously, I try to, to catch all the requirements, um, but they're very active in terms of connectivity and pathways. And um, I appreciate the support that um, I'm sure I get from all of you, too. Um, so I'm not sure if that covered information according to expectation or if you even had expectations. Um, but I would stand for any questions. Um, we can double back or just if, you, if there are any other things you want to know. Um, I call that complete. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Kim. Really appreciate the presentation, and um, I did. I loved going on the on the bike tour and everything. That was really eye opening, and um, gave me a lot more information to look at, especially as far as everything's mapped out and coordinated. So it's it was really, really unique. Very nice. So glad you came, and it feels so different to be out there. I mean, oh, so much of my life is spent on the map, and. Um, so I think that might be something we will, you know, we might cast a slightly wider net and, and, you know, invite, we can't really have 50 people on this bike ride or it feels more like a racer event and it's hard to communicate, but I think it would be fun to include, you know, com other commission members. I know we had some public works people join us this year. So um, do reach out. I could also do, um, you know, I. I'm going to tell our commission next week in the follow-up just that I'd be happy to do kind of a makeup tour because some of them missed. So if there's ever an interest, um, I know we have a few bikes here at City Hall, and no pressure, but I'd be happy to either propose a route or you know some ideas for where it would be good to ride or or lead another impromptu tour. It's fun yeah. to to have to do that. That would be. <laughs> great. Anyone else? Anybody have some questions, comments? M yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you, Kim. That was really eye-opening to me. I'm, I'm, I'm on an HOA and I didn't even know that these went through our subdivision and just looking at them, it makes sense. I kind of go, oh, that's why that's all, that's wider and that's different than, so thank you for that. But a question as far as the, for the commission is concerned, is it fair to say though that we should be cognizant of, you know, when we get projects brought before us of any Certainly direct effects, I, I, I would assume they cannot impede any of these, but even indirect negative possible effects of, of anything that might, you know, be detrimental to these pathways. Is that sort of a fair statement we should be watching out for? Yes, Commissioner. I, I think one thing that I'm very careful of is the irrigation district. Um, and I try to be very explicit with development applicants that, you know, we can only condition things on pr the private property, the subject property. We can't require anything to be built within those easements. Someone may get permission to do that. What happened? And that is um, acceptable. Zach? Oh, looks, looks like we had somebody fall. Oh dear. Okay, yeah, me too. <laughs> Oh. oh, something, somebody got hurt. Okay, Chris, all right, all right, sure, okay. But back to your question, Commissioner Grace. Um, I guess I do try to watch out for the requirements of the irrigation district. Um, we don't wanna miss these. I mean, this is our chance to get through and it can be incredibly, not so much with these HOAs, but um, we don't want to miss that chance because it's easy at the time of development. Someone's going to need to build a seven-foot sidewalk anyway. That may as well be 10. Um, and then there is an opportunity for them to build it even off their property. We just, don't, we just can't require that. Um, there are sometimes 
conflicts or discrepancies between what the code will require landscape-wise and what the irrigation district will allow. I think a lot of that has been worked out, but I know sometimes there are, um, and I probably don't know the planning terminology, um, maybe you need to seek an alternative compliance because you know would say plant trees along the pathway and the district would say, no, you can't plant trees in our easement. So there are issues like that where sometimes it has to be finessed and that landscape can happen elsewhere. Um, but I consider myself the, um, yeah, I try to uphold the rules of our agreement just because it is so key to the system. We have a good partner. I'd like to keep his life as simple as possible. Um, but I generally feel really supported in this job. I'm sure you're all a part of it. Are there any more specific questions? Did that answer your question? No, thank you, that did. I just, okay. um, just awareness on our part. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead, Mission Lord. Um, you alluded to a possible rails and trails program. Is that something that's uh, currently being discussed or something for the future? It has been discussed for a while. Um, <clears throat> in Meridian, locally, we have a rail with trail project just west of City Hall um, that we've been working on getting right away for. So it would be the mile. Um, it's only alongside the corridor, and that's as close as we've gotten to date. But it's the mile between Meridian Road and Linder, I think, is the next. So that's a near-term aim. When development occurs next to the corridor, I mean, the, the rail width trail shows up on our pathways map, um, but it's outside of the irrigation um, right away because we, we haven't had those talks or negotiations. There was a rail with trail work group that you know laid out a route, um, hired a consultant to do some, like a crossing study several years ago, and then some some cost estimates and next steps. <clears throat> and they're, as part of now, Compass's active transportation work group. Um, rail with trail is, is part of that. So there is talk, and it's a goal, and it's just, um, it's been done in other places. Um, there's a fair amount of rail traffic. You've probably noticed if you're in downtown Meridian when those trains come through. Um, there are a few rail spurs, I, like the irrigation district, um, the railroad is, and their clients are really worried about conflicts. So um, I think it's going to take a while, but ultimately the vision is for um, that pathway to go from, you know, share a portion of the corridor and go from Nampa to Alta Micron. So it would be really a huge commuter asset. Um, um, but I think just a long game. Um, there are active things going on, but not a lot of momentum until we can kind of um, engage more fully with the railroads. Mr. Chair? Go right ahead. Um, hello, Kim. Uh, just a quick question here. or I've got several here that kind of spurred my thoughts on this one. Was One was, um, are there any federal funds that come through in order to help out within these pathways? Because I know that they are interested in also supporting, like, alternatives to, to just normal vehicular transportation. So I didn't know if we were able to tap into that. Yes, Commissioner. In fact, we, on the rail alongside trail that I was just talking about west of City Hall, um, we, we do have some federal funding. I think, boy, Caleb would probably know better, LTAC or H, some federal funds for pathways. And we've been we've kind of had those on hold and we just heard that um, we're going to be able to do a land trade to complete the right of way out to third street so yes we're scrambling now to use some of that federal funding that was approved years ago on half of that um, rail with trail again alongside trail from meridian road to about eighth street so yes um we we do that sometimes. It can be there are more requirements to meet with the federal funds, obviously. Um, but we've kind of uh, we've geared up to, to do that. We're we're smarter about some of those than we were a few years ago when we ran into. Well, yeah. Sure. What yeah, else? I, I just remembered 
When I lived in Sacramento, they had a pathway there that went from Old Town, Sacramento, clear out to Beals Point. It was 32 and a half miles, and you could ride your bike the whole way, and they actually used federal funds in order to do that because they looked at it as an alternative green pathway on it. So it was just kind of like, oh, maybe we could tap into you some of that too for it. So that's yeah. great. Um, another question I had was, are there any sort of like, um, I think you kind of addressed this a little bit, but like jurisdiction or tension issues between like HOAs and the Napa Meridian Irrigation District when it comes down to some of the maintenance requirements that they're asking for? Or what do we know about that? I mean, I understand that we hand it off, right? The city hands it off and then it's out of our hands, but sometimes we might hear some things on the back end of that. Are, are we hearing anything on that where we're hearing some tensions? Well, Commissioner, I think, I mean, I do get calls um, and try to kind of step in when I can. I know that Greg Curtis at the Irrigation District also gets calls. People worry if they're cutting vegetation and sometimes it's our job to say, well, um, they have a mission to do and these are their properties and if they need to get vegetation out of the way, they can do that. Um, I do know that they will wait for some of the baby birds to kind of fly the nest before they do. I mean, there's some thought given to that. Um, the uh, I know we just had a case with an HOA um, in South Meridian where they wanted to do repairs. They were aware that that was their responsibility. Um, they do need to check in with the irrigation district and get a, a license agreement to do that work and to be doing work within the easement. So I do some fielding of calls and kind of explaining of rules. Um, I. Yeah, I, th I think it, it works pretty well. I think there are going to be cases with maintenance later on where there will be a lot more pathway. It's new now, relatively, that need to be maintained, and we'll see if this policy works for the city if we need to change. Okay, okay. What else? The, the, the width on the pathway does vary, correct, on that? It can be up to 10 feet, 12 feet, whatever, and it can be down to seven. It just kind of depends. It can be asphalt, it can be concrete, and go back and forth on that, right? Or even gravel at this point, or dirt? We don't have any provisions for gravel pathways. Okay. Um, as a runner, I love a gravel pathway, but um, it's more, it requires more in terms of ongoing maintenance. So we allow asphalt and concrete. Uh, we do like them paved our minimum width. We usually ask for a 14 foot easement, so it's a 10 foot pathway with two, two foot shoulders. That can vary if it's up against a roadway or a right of way. Um, but yeah, that is our minimum to count like as an amenity, um, is that 10 foot for the multi-use pathway. There may be a couple of spots where it necks down, but that's kind of unofficial. It's not our standard. Gotcha. And then the last one here, the question I have is, some of these pathways go through some pretty major intersections too, right? Like I'm looking here at Eagle and Overland. Um, that's... Uh, if I'm on a if I'm on a joy ride or walk or with stroll you know strollers or whatever with my kids or whatever the case is, um, which none of my kids are in strollers, so I don't even know why I brought that up. But you know, I'm, I was having a flashback. Sorry, um, but if I was to go through there with some with a group or something like that, that intersection would be pretty tough to go, and then to see how that would cross over the interstate I-84 with the clover leaf and <laughs> all these kinds of things. So I'm wondering, are there what do we do with the safety side on the pathways? What do we do with things that maybe there's alternatives for these kinds of pathways to where people can just kind of get on these things and just enjoy without the, the busyness around them? Yeah, Commissioner, I absolutely hear you. Um, big roads here, lots of traffic, it moves quickly, and even a signaled intersection feels, you feel a little vulnerable. Um, up in the Northwest, um, I know where Linder Road is extending along the river into Eagle. We're working on getting a pedestrian underpass at the five, I think it's just the green belt there. Um, so we're talking about a vertical separation wherever there is a possibility. There will be an opportunity to do that at the Five Mile Creek um, and State Highway 16. So State Highway 16 goes north just it's just offset from McDermott. It's kind of out by the new high school. Um, so there, we will have a chance there for a pathway. It'll need to cross McDermott, but I believe it'll be sort of a frontage road at that point. Um, and that'll be a relatively long run. We look for those opportunities. When we do cross over the interstate on a vehicle bridge, 
Um, you know, we usually try to get that 10 foot or maybe even a little wider pathway. Um, it's, and I know that with, we have moved also with, um, alongside arterial roadways rather than a bike lane, which is what ACHD tends to do in Boise, um, we've moved to a preference to get those facilities up off the roadway and be fully detached just so that pedestrian feel, feel, pedestrians feel easier and, and a bit safer and more removed. Commuters don't always like those as well, so it's an interesting balance. But, um, but that is kind of meridian. It's the challenge of how do you, um, we looked at an underpass um, potentially to go under a future bridge at Star Road, um, but that right of way was 130 feet wide, and it was just such a long tunnel that it felt it was, it turned out to be quite expensive and it just didn't feel friendly um, for, especially for the cost. So we do have our challenges here, I think, and the terrain is basically flat and it's hard to get that separation um, from the roadways. We have mid-mile crossings of some of the, um, but the, the highways can be especially daunting. So I hear you and we're, we're mindful that we work with ACHD to get pedestrian dedicated crossings where we can. Um, yeah, and but, I understand. I mean, to go ahead and make a, your own bridge is going to span 130 feet in its own causeway system. That doesn't make any sense. Or to tunnel underneath a you know six lane interstate that doesn't make and two off ramps. I mean that that's cost prohibitive and borderline insane to do that. You know, so it, I I get that aspect too. And you have these normal impediments to just these nice pathways that you have with it. So. Um, I appreciate it. I like it. I like the way that it connects. I know that Commissioner Seal constantly, you know, when we have these things with the pathways, I like the pathways. Let's see what we can do and stuff. And so I've kind of jumped on board with it too and just kind of gone like, this is great. I love seeing these kinds of things like that. Um, one, one bit of suggestion I would, I would have is on maybe some of these longer ones that are straight or some of these ones that have like some distance that's between before they end or whatever, maybe just have some fun and have some, some, uh, um, markers on the on the pathway itself, whether it be every tenth of a mile, every mile, right? Because then people could go and run these things and know exactly where these markers are at, or ride their bikes on these things, or hey, every tenth of a mile, I'm going to do so many push-ups, or just things like this, just for markers for the people that ride them too. That's an excellent suggestion, and I know we've it's definitely in the thought mill. Um, in the summer, we're having the Urban Land <coughs> Institute visit. I don't know if you've heard of this organization, but um, we got connected with them and we're sponsoring a panel. So these real estate and design professionals will visit and do some problem solving for us on our pathway system. And placemaking and wayfinding is part of that. I know when we were on the tour, um, it's easy to get lost on this big grid. You know, we're, it, it's a mile long grid, but sometimes you'll you'll come up to a street and think, now is this Black Cat or is this Ten Mile? And and that sounds odd, but but I had the idea that maybe as you come up, you you actually identify the street right there on the pathway. Maybe it's paint. Maybe you have intermittent markings. It's um, yeah, that's definitely a great idea, and I think um, people are able to navigate via their phones, but they don't want to be on their phones when they're out there. So what is a good way to help with wayfinding and marking things like that? Um, so that's a great suggestion. I, we're, we're also working on versions of that. Keep up the great work. ULI is a great, comp great group. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's, been, it's a good opportunity. So. And on the uh, marking parts of it, the, um, I know the Green Belt worked with several Boy Scouts that were doing their Eagle Project to mark a lot of that down there with um, essentially different markings so they could call in if um, there was an emergency or something like that. They can say, I'm at mile marker, whatever it is, in the blue part of the Boise Green Belt, and they'll instantly know where that's at. So, Yeah, that's a good point. And I think things like safety and being able to locate people quickly are of more concern as, as we grow. Um, I've also seen great examples of art or you know things painted on pathways. So I think that could be integrated you know, just with, with the placemaking component of it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? No? Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming in and educating us on the pathway system, and we hope to see it grow.
and continue growing. So surprisingly fast right now, but Wonderful. that's okay. <laughs> it is. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being here. Um, let me know if you have additional questions. Um, I'm happy to attend a meeting or come back in a year. Or um, So don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Caleb, are you ready? Mr. Chair, I'm ready. Are, are you guys okay if I stay here? I'm pretty comfortable here in this seat. So, all right. Um, so, commissioners, thank you for this opportunity uh, to address you tonight. Kind of like like uh, Kim, I don't know if this is a training necessarily, but I appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening and have a discussion anyways. Uh, there are some things I would like to, to talk about with you, um, and hopefully it helps your meetings run more efficiently and you become more and more uh, comfortable uh, as a commissioner. Thank you for your service, by the way, and volunteering your Thursday evenings twice a month. Um, last last month, uh, we so if you don't know, we have a staff meeting um, prior to these meetings and kind of just run through the agenda, any last minute things that may come up regarding the agenda. And our last meeting, talked to the chair and vice chair about uh, looking for opportunities to potentially do something like this, maybe quarterly, um, invite guests from time to time, like the Ada County Highway District. Maybe it's an irrigation district, the school district. Um, little, understand a little bit more about their processes and procedures and codes, again, to make you more well-rounded, not inferring you're not uh, well-rounded now, but just to you know, put some more um, of the puzzle together with some, maybe some pieces that you'd like to have. And I think that's part of my the conversation we're going to have tonight is, you don't know what you don't know, but are, are there some things that you'd like to know more about? Are there some folks we should invite that you're like, you know what, this one I still don't understand. Maybe I could address it. Maybe we invite a, a special guest at a workshop. And again, what we're thinking is maybe doing something like this roughly quarterly um, and having either city staff or uh, our agency partners or others come and, and have some of this um, discussion with you all. I have a list started. Um, but please feel free to email myself, Bill Parsons. Um, if there are topics, uh, they don't even have to be kind of like you'll see tonight. I'm going to kind of be all over the place with some things. It's not, it's not very organized or I'll be talking about subdivisions and then we'll talk about agriculture or something. You know, it's, it's not, um, um, uh, there's not one theme tonight. So any, anything, any questions you have, please shoot them my way and, and we'll add that to a list and then again, work with the chair on workshops maybe just by quick head nod generally that sounds okay to maybe do some some training a discussion roughly quarterly okay the other one I what may be your next one um, uh, is meeting with the city council and so that to me that's kind of a joint purpose uh, more so you can um, get to know them a little bit better as people and, and your elected officials but also maybe do a joint training again with our legal staff and um, just a way to, again, kind of connect with them, make sure things are going smoothly, and, and just to get, get to know them a, a little bit better. So that's in process, and hopefully we can, the stars can align, and, and that can happen before the end of the year, certainly, again, if not, maybe even later this summer or fall. Um, so we'll, I'll be in contact soon to kind of check calendars and see if there's something like that um, where we can get a majority, if not all of you, and council to attend on something like that. Um, I also wanted to just let you know, as I found out last week that there was an opportunity to do this, I did reach out to um, some of my contacts that we've historically um, leaned on to do some of this training, um, other planners, um, some folks that deal with the Association of Idaho Cities and Idaho Counties, to say, hey, is there anything in, in Idaho that does some training um, for commissioners? Because this is a universal thing uh, throughout the state. Um, I just heard back actually today um, that there's some momentum afoot to put together um, some training modules online. Um, I got a draft list of the, the topics that they're considering. So as early as this October, they hope to have the first couple of modules available. So five to eight minute video sessions on different topics um, j just for fun. Uh, and some of them are pretty basic and some of them are more advanced and that's kind of how it will start. Um, I just want to read some of the subtopics to you. I, I think this will, this will be great. If there's other things you want them to address, though, again, please feel free to shoot me an email. I can let you know if they're already on their list of videos to make. Um, if not, we can uh, look to add it. But keys to successful planning in local jurisdictions, roles and responsibilities of a PNZ commission member, 
lawful conditions for decisions, findings of fact and conclusions of law, and quasi-judicial decision-making. Some of it sounds pretty dry, but I think it would be um, useful. Uh, steps to building a better commission, actions that implement your comp plan, zoning variances, and non-conformities. Uh, there's probably about 40 or 50 that they already have kind of list, but those ones seem kind of interesting, and I think there, again, could be some value in that uh, going forward. Um, like I said, I'm going to jump into kind of my um, the presentation. Um, Kurt also has something at the end. I think we're, we're okay on time, hopefully. I'm not trying to belabor this, draw this out longer, keep you longer than we need to be. Um, but Kurt, I think, would like five or ten minutes. I will leave some time, too, at the end for Q&A. But again, a discussion. Feel free to interrupt. Be, you know, If I move on too fast, you want to follow up on any of the things I'm about to hit you with, um, feel free to just jump in. So, okay. Thanks, Caleb. Okay, so I want to kind of start. It's a refresher, but sort of at the beginning. And um, my role with the city is largely on the long-range um, planning side. I do a lot with transportation as well, but the comprehensive plan is kind of near and dear to my heart and what I deal with uh, most of the time. I also live in the world of codes and standards in the UDC, but I am not charged with implementing those so often. I do uh, interpret that, but I, I am not daily in the UDC. But the comprehensive plan, I just want to reinforce what it is and, and how we use it and ask that you do as well. And again, I'm not trying to talk down to you. I know you all generally understand this, but just to reinforce um, that that comprehensive plan is a guide for our community that has a lot of goals and policies of who we want to be. Uh, into the future, it isn't code. So there's interpretation to that. A lot of the the policy statements you can interpret one way or the other, and that's largely why you're here. You get to decide: Does this policy even apply in this situation? And if so, how do I think we're going to move towards applying that policy? Um, so it is different than again the UDC and the codes and the standards that we have for development. But the comp plan does um, even guide our code a lot of time. We'll have policies about implementing um, the Pathways Master Plan that Kim just talked about. The standards are 10 feet wide, two foot shoulders, five foot landscaping on each side. That's, that's the standard, that's the law. How it can kind of go, that's more of a comp plan thing. Yeah, we need to get from A to B, um, but there's a little bit of wiggle room in that. Um, the other thing I guess that's, I'll just, I'll say it this way, it's sort of a de facto requirement is the, the density ranges for residential. So we did address this with the 2019 comprehensive plan that the low you know, zero to three, and we, we clarify that it's a rounding. So you can go up to 3.49 and still be in low. Once you get to 3.5, that's we consider that four and you're up into the medium. And so that is something where if, we, if, if a project is submitted to planning staff and they have a medium density res, residential designation in the comp plan on the future land use map, um, so three to eight dwelling units per acre, and they have 2.4, they need to do a comp plan amendment to go to low. Or if they have 8.5, they need to do a comp plan amendment and go to medium high. Um, so that one is where we are pretty particular. But again, it's a range in there. It's not a, a hit it right on the head. But they have to be within that range to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, I haven't noticed that. I, I don't think that's been an issue for this commission. But I that one is... Um, pretty hard and fast as far as comp plan things go, where a project has to fit within that. There's an expectation from our community, and we spent a lot of hours uh, with community members saying, if I see this shade of yellow, I expect to see that density. Um, and so, when a, again, when a project is proposed that doesn't meet that, that is the process to do a future land use map amendment. Um, I, I have the table, and I don't expect you to memorize it. I don't have it memorized. Um, as you know, some of your projects, you are the decision-making body. Sometimes you make a recommendation to council. Sometimes you're not even officially part of that review process. A variance is a good example. Variance or an access to a, an arterial roadway or a highway. Um, by our code, you aren't in that process of review. You don't make a recommendation to the council on that. You aren't approved. You aren't um, um, part of the process to approve that. Um, that said. It is part of the overall application. It's a companion application that we don't expect you to just pretend like it doesn't exist, right? I mean, if they need an access to a highway to make their project work, and you're like, well, I don't like this project if you don't have that access, you don't have to like the project, right? We aren't asking you to say approve or deny the variance, but if your 
consistency with the comp plan and whether you believe that that project is in the best interest of the community or not is predicated on them getting an access, you don't have to approve the project. So there's kind of a, um, again, it's, it's a relationship or it's all intertwined. So part of your motion doesn't have to be we are denying the variance or approving a variance. But again, um, you can certainly talk about it and the merits of an access point, again, in this scenario, or any other thing that just goes to the council. If they need a development agreement modification, right? That's pretty standard. You see development agreement modifications. Um, so feel free to have those convers that, that conversation amongst yourselves, even though you're not officially or technically part of that review approval recommendation um, process. Um, So staff recommendations uh, are largely based on the comp plan and UDC compliance. Um, the other piece of that, I guess, that we aren't privy to a lot of times, so certainly we check the record and can see who's written the letter, but um, you know the public testimony that is verbal, we aren't privy to, it hasn't happened yet. So when we write a staff report, a lot of the things you're reading about, we didn't have these perspectives. That is certainly part of your job is to consider whatever you're hearing, hearing from the, the people that are present and, and providing that testimony. Um, I just want to provide you some assurance, and I'm not encouraging you to do this necessarily, um, but don't be afraid either. If you if you don't agree with staff's recommendation, it is it is okay and appropriate, and we will sleep at night most of the times, if you disagree with staff's analysis and recommendation. It is okay. Again, the comp plan has some, there's some gray area in there, and that's why you get paid the big bucks is to figure out, yep, this is, this, this is Meridian, or no, it's not. And depending, either way, staff recommended now, you can recommend approval or vice versa. Um, so be confident in that. If you have questions on that, we can even help, help you with some of those findings to get there. Sometimes if staff has uh, written a staff report for denial, there aren't gonna be conditions of approval, so you'll likely have to continue that back to staff so we can draft up some conditions for approval if that's what you wanna do. Um, I will say I'm proud of my staff. They do a good job of analyzing projects and providing you that information, but we're not right all the time, and again, you have, there's other elements for you to consider in your in, while you do your job. So, um, my my kind of follow up to that point is we do spend a lot of time writing staff reports, and I would just request that you, you don't have to read every word, but become familiar with them, understand them, and if you don't, feel free to give us a call. Um, I don't know how much of this Kurt's going to talk about, but this is an ex parte communications. We are essentially on the we're on the same team and essentially one. You can call us. And hey, you know what, I read this, I didn't understand this, Sonia, can you tell me what this means on page three or how this works or your thought process or, or whatever. So, and a lot of times that may be a question that the rest of the commission has and we can, we can share that with everybody on Thursday night. But if you're reading this over the weekend and you got a question, shoot us an email, call us on Monday or Tuesday, whatever that looks like. So we are here to help you in that process. Um, so um, feel free to reach out. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover there. Again, transitioning, and these transitions are a little rough. Um, I want to provide you an update on the UDC uh, updates. So for those of you that don't know, we have a standing committee, um, what we lovingly refer to as the UDC focus group. Um, it is a wide range of developers, engineers, architects, um, citizens, staff from various departments, um, other agencies, and they're kind of on call. And roughly twice a year we go through this process, we keep a running list of things in code that are either not clear or could change just because our society changes, our community is changing, and we vet these and discuss them through this UDC focus group. We've had, I think, three or four meetings already with this round of uh, UDC focus group. We've got one more. We just sent out what we thought was going to be maybe the rough final draft. Got a request to have sit down one more time and discuss that. So we're hopeful here by the end of the month we'll... I'll wrap that up, submit an application. So probably July or August, you'll hear, you'll see a UDC uh, text amendment proposed. Some of the headliners on that, um, we're looking at the parking standards for multifamily and vertically integrated projects. So that, again, is a topic most of the time, probably when you have a multifamily project, we're looking at changing those standards. So you'll see that. Um, Kim mentioned multi-use pathways. For those of you that don't know, ACHD is going to t away from the bike lanes for the arterial roadways and going to uh, curb height uh, multi-use pathway. So 10 foot wide multi-use pathway on their capital project. So when they widen a roadway, 
you're going to see not the bike lanes with the, you know, the bike, um, um, not sharrows, but the, um, the, I can think of the, the symbol anyways, that there's a bike lane there um, to, again, a, a joint uh, multi-use pathway uh, above the curb. So we are addressing that in our code that detached sidewalks are largely going away and they're going to be this 10-foot um, facility instead of uh, sidewalks. Live work units and vertically integrated. I know you've had some discussions with some re recent projects and, oh, look, there's a little bit of non-residential right there. This is vertically integrated or this is live work. So we're, we're tightening up those definitions and what qualifies as live work and vertically integrated and making sure that it's clear um, the difference there. So um, just a few of the things that I know you've had conversations uh, about over the last several months and we're looking to clarify some of those things. I want to spend um, just a couple minutes too on roadways and transportation. So again, uh, that's kind of that's one of the things I'm I'm pretty heavily involved with, and I just want to make sure you're up to speed as as someone that serves on a city uh, commission. You may get asked these types of questions, and so I want to arm you with it with as much information as you may need. Um, there's, I'm certainly not going to be able to cover all of it in the next few minutes, um, but I wanted to highlight some of the things um, that that may come up. So our number one priority for the city right now is the Linda Road overpass as far as transportation projects go. Um, this is an overpass of the interstate at Linda Road. So the entire project would actually go from Overland to Franklin. But the headliner there again is um, an overpass that would look like Cloverdale or even Locust Grove, real, real similar as far as a bridge over um, goes. Just last week, the interagency agreement between the city and Ada County Highway District uh, was approved and ACHD is uh, working with Keller and Associates here just downtown Meridian to do that design work. The city has pledged up to two and a half million dollars to do that design. Um, it should take about 18 months to, to complete that work. Um, we did you not have the construction dollars which is roughly and who knows what construction is going to look like in two, three, four years when it's time to construct but roughly 22 million dollars right now. Um, again, cost of labor and materials, who knows what that looks like, but um, we don't have that funding source for the construction identified. So the mayor has uh, stood up a, a task force that meets as needed, but roughly every other month to discuss design elements that we want to see happen with this project. And then we strategize about shaking trees and finding the money and, and different programs, federal programs, whether it's federal dollars, local funds, matching, how do we, how do we get this thing to happen? So. Um, anyways, just wanted to let you know that there's some things going on there, largely behind the scenes, um, but we are trying to advance that, that project. Um, US 2026, what ITD calls Chinden West. So a lot of construction has occurred. There's still more happening over the next several years. I want to walk you through that. Again, there's multiple phases. Um, there's websites that ITD has that are pretty good, actually, with um, these next two projects I'm gonna to talk to you about, 2026 and State Highway 16. So if you just Google search those, like ITD, Chinden West, or State Highway 16, it'll be one of the first two things that pop up there and you can go there and, and learn more about it. But um, 2026, four lanes in the interim, it will eventually be a six lane facility in Meridian. Um, but they're going through the corridor, widening it to four lanes first, and then they're basically gonna hop back and wide, wide, expand it to six and, and uh, upgrade some of the intersections. I'm going to kind of walk you through that um, west to east. So, and I'm actually going to start in Canyon County because that's where they start is Middleton Road. So that's about five miles outside of Meridian. Um, but that first segment they have is Middleton to Star. So again, that's about six miles. Um, they just had a, a public involvement meeting last week on this um, on that segment. I don't know how it went. Um, Jacobs Engineering is working for ITD on that one. Um, they do plan on constructing that. So again, six miles broken up, but over uh, in construction in 2024 and 25. Then working from Star to um, State Highway 16, that construction is planned for next year, 2023. And then going from um, Idaho 16 to Linder Road, that's done. Again, as far as the four lanes is concerned, that's complete. And then Linder Road to Locust Grove, that's the bottleneck area that we have right now. That's actually should be going into construction here this summer as well. So um, th that developer is moving forward uh, to get that done. 
And then Locust Grove to Eagle was done, I think it's been done for about 18 months now or so. So that, that kind of completes the corridor and Meridian. So it's a little bit hopscotch with the construction stuff, but here in the next few years, the entire thing should be four lanes wide. So again, if you want any more details on that, uh, the Chinden West Corridor website's pretty good. And then State Highway 16, again, I want to kind of walk you through that um, a little bit. So originally, maybe a little bit of history on this, originally, the, the construction was supposed to go all the way from Idaho, um, from, excuse me, Interstate uh, 84, all the way up to 44. Um, but the state had to take it off in chunks, and so it is what you have now for between 2026 and 44 is the, is the section that we've had now for, what, a decade or so? Um, and not a whole lot has been happening. Design and, and right-of-way acquisition has been occurring, but not a whole lot of any new construction in that corridor. Um, well, just this spring, ITD has let the first first two phases out of three. So now they've taken phase two, which would be I-84 to Chinden, and broken that into three segments. Um, the first segment is going to go from Interstate 84 to Franklin. So not very far. That's only like three quarters of a mile. Um, and then the second phase is from Chinden to Eustick, so two miles. And then the middle phase goes from Franklin to Eustick. If that makes sense. So that's they've let these two, the, the northern and the southern uh, uh, phases, subphases, have um, uh, have been put out on the street for construction, and will likely go into construction. Um, I think later this year. But let me read my notes. Yeah, summer of 2022 is when when they um, anticipate doing that. The bid package for the the middle segment, so you stick to Franklin, has not yet been let but probably later this summer, so construction will lag a little bit behind with that. But things are happening over there, so that's really what I wanted you to know if you hadn't heard already, um, that things are progressing certainly more quickly than I would have thought, but the state's in a pretty good position and got some funds from um, the legislature to move some uh, transportation projects forward, and that, and that was one of them that benefited from the surplus. Um, so that's moving forward. Okay, uh, I'm almost done. Um, State Highway 69, this one will be pretty quick. So this is something that ITD has hired uh, six mile engineers to study um, um, Kunamora to uh, Overland Road and look at the, f the future of State Highway 69. Um, likely where that's, where that's playing out will be a six lane wide um, State Highway 16, 69 Meridian Road. Um, they are still um, evaluating some of the two through movements and the intersection alignments and drainage and things like that. But I, I anticipate to have a draft report here probably like later this summer. And I can share that with you all as well. But again, for Meridian, over time, it'll be, they're trying to stay within the existing right of way, which is about 100 feet. Um, but they think that they can get um, three lanes in each direction over time uh, in that 100 feet. Okay, those are the things I wanted to just share with you. I will also follow up with an email. I got a couple of other documents I just want to, ha so you can have. One of them I think is really cool, and I don't want to gloss over this, but it's called the Land Use Report. Um, Brian McClure in my office spends quite a bit of time um, putting this together, but it's got all kinds of cool charts and graphs and stats, and um, it has, uh, for your purposes, I think the ones you'll, you'll find most interesting is... Um, overall area of impact and how much we've annexed and in what zones and how many lots and and so it's just it has a lot of good information about our zoning and how we're building out and developing in the community so um, look for that and if you have any questions you can follow up with myself or brian and then i'm also going to share with you in february the council heard from um, west ada school district staff on some of their projections for enrollment and future school facilities and so you, you don't have to watch that video. It's probably about 45 minutes long or so, but I'm going to send you a link to the YouTube video where you can watch it and just listen to Marcy Horner's presentation to our council on their rationale and their methodology. You know, COVID behind kind of sort of, what does that look like with all these prep academies and people homeschooling? And you can just kind of hear from them, their thought process and what they think the next decade or so looks like and how they're accounting for the continued growth that we are experiencing and what they're doing for school sites and, and um, building new facilities. So 
Um, I will pause, but I'm looking at Kurt, so if I don't know if you want to jump in or if you have questions now, I could certainly entertain some. But um. you know, Mr. Chairman, I recommend if the commissioners have questions for Caleb, that might be the, the next logical step. And then if time permits and if you're interested, I can wrap it up with about a 10-minute presentation on my subject. But probably should stick with Caleb's subjects and see if there's any questions. Okay, that sounds good. Now, there's a couple of things I'll throw in there. Um, Caleb said, you know, call, email, or whatever. Um, something I've learned in the past, personally, is when you do that, do it on an individual basis. Um, I'm, I'm a reply to all kind of guy when it comes to email, and that ends up turning into conversations that we're having via email, which we shouldn't be having. So, um, and staff has been good about when calls come in individually or emails come in individually, if it's information that needs to be shared, you know, with a group or on, you know, as part of public record, then that does get entered in as part of the public record. If there's a mistake somewhere, if there's something like that going on. So, um, one of the questions I had real quick was on the roads, um, like McMillan, that are not currently meeting the level of service. Is there, you know, what are we doing about those? Because that seems to be, there's a lot of contention over that, <laughs> things like that right now. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, McMillan is an interesting corridor. Um, as you know, I mean, with especially with the canal and those large power poles for a, a good chunk of it, um, that roadway and capacity issues on McMillan in particular, um, over time, McMillan is not going to be a five-lane roadway. ACHD has made that decision that it's going to be, it's a constrained corridor, and it won't be five lanes wide. It's just not the cost-benefit of doing some of those does not uh, make sense. There is a um, level of service map that they share with us annually as we get into the prioritization process. So they have, without getting into all these details, because uh, I will invite them to give you a little bit more in depth of how they choose what projects they do. Um, there's a cost benefit that they assign to everything and safety is factored in. Um, again, cost obviously is part of a cost benefit analysis, but that's how they come up with their priority crashes. Um, capacity enhancements. Um, there's a spreadsheet that they have and, a, and an associated level of service map. Um, there are quite a few red areas on that map, meaning level of service F. Um, they don't have enough resources to plug all of those holes. Um, and I'm afraid McMillan is going to be one of those where it's going to be red because it's not great, doesn't function well, but there's just not a good solution to it. So they are addressing things like Eustic, the Eustic corridor, you know, uh, as a parallel route with what's happening with ITD and through the STARS program to make some of the improvements on 2026 I just talked about. There's hope that that can relieve some of that pressure a little bit on nearby corridors to address some of that. ACHD does have priority corridors that they um, like to finish 10 miles one, or they're really trying to get 10 mile all the way widened. There's still work going on towards CUNA, but that's a major corridor. So some east-west, some north-south, but rather than a mile here and go over a mile and do a mile there, they're trying to do seven to 10 miles and, and give a good um, corridor that way. Probably didn't fully answer your question. If you have other examples, McMillan, I just know is gonna be tough yeah. um, because there's five lanes, you just can't, can't fit in there without some serious uh, relocation. Yeah, and the question was kind of more towards what we can do as a city as we look at the comprehensive plan, the zoning that's out there as far as, you know, instead of an R8 or especially an R15, we might want to lean towards more of an R2, R4 redistricting out there just to make sure that if it's already of, you know, a level of service of F, for instance, in areas like that, and we've come across that with, um, you know, subdivisions trying to go in that have quite a bit of density, um, you know, to kind of eliminate some of the contention is to maybe look at those a little bit more, especially if they've been rated that way for quite a while and there doesn't seem to be a solution in sight, so. It's a good point. I, I will um, say you have a couple of opportunities. and. Um, by state code, you have a lot of authority in the comprehensive plan. Um, in fact, the LUPA talks about planning commissions more than it does a city council. Um, so it really does rely heavily on on things like that. If that's something you want us to bring up, Mr. Chair, um, you know our, our current comprehensive plan isn't that old. It was adopted late 2019. We spent two years, two and a half years getting to that point. Um, 
off the top of my head, I don't know all the land uses along McMillan, but we could certainly look at that a little bit closer and scrutinize that a little bit more. Um, so that is within your purview. So things like that, let me know. We can have a workshop about that and, and talk about that. Obviously, we're going to daylight it more than just, you know, a yeah. couple staff members and no one from the public. But, um, yeah, things like that, shoot me an email or, or again, Bill, and we'll, we'll add that to a list of topics. Okay, great. Anybody else? Got anything for Caleb? Oh, go ahead. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, I will fully concede that I'm probably just speaking for myself because I'm rather new. Um, but when I heard about the possibility of some training for us, I really was excited because um, I remember the, the first time I walked into the back room there and you, and you guys were there and you trained, gave us a, a binder of PowerPoint slides and trained us up and it was great. Um, now, after having done this for three months, um, and maybe this goes more toward the email you'd rather get than to discuss it right now, but I, I would love for someone to just stand up and go through an agenda item and explain to me everything that I'm looking at um, in terms of, you know, I, intuitively I can kind of figure it out, but, but getting into the, I'll be honest with you, Caleb, I probably just a lot of times jump to the staff recommendations because that's, you guys are the subject matter experts. If you find something that I'm, you know, I'm, uh, until I come up to speed a little more, who am I to disagree with you? So again, this might just, the way I preface this is this might just be a, a Patrick Grace issue, but um, I, I would personally love for someone to go, here's what you're looking at. Here's what planning and zoning is said. Here's what the, you know, I can hit the links, I can go to those things, um, but sometimes I don't always know. And so I, maybe you guys have been here a while or already feel like you understand that piece. I don't know, Mandy, if you feel the way I do, but um, anyway, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Um, but I will admit I kind of maybe overanalyze things too much. Um, can I just, well, I'll ask that offline. Um, <clears throat> I guess that was it. Um, well, Mr. Chair, can I just, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that. sorry, Kim. Yeah. Maybe just to that point. So first of all, I'd say, you know, don't sell yourself short. Give yourself some credit. I think, I think you're doing fine. Um, and I guess part of that, I think, um, when staff gives the presentation about a project, Ho hopefully it is, it's not gonna be comprehensive, right? It's not gonna cover every comp plan policy and every, T crossed and I dotted. But we should be doing a good job because you got public members here that likely don't really understand the stuff either, right? You're gonna be several steps ahead of most people that are in the audience. So if some of that feedback is, and that's what I'm trying to process as you're talking, we need to be able in five minutes or so to explain a project, what's on the table, what we're looking at, any issues, and maybe potential solutions or changes to that. So, um, I'm, I'm trying to understand what that training, if, it, if we're going to call it training, should be. I mean, we can get into annexation and zoning, what that means, but it is kind of in the name. You, they want to come into the city, right? And we, I know I am a creature of acronym habits and short, you know, get, can get a little, um, use some of our shorthand stuff and, and maybe gloss over some things that really are foundational that maybe we assume everybody knows, but they don't. Um, and please don't think I was making any, that comment reflects on, on the quality of what, they do a great job of explaining it to us. Um, I guess I'm just looking at the, the actual what's in this packet and what am I, what am I looking at? Okay, what's so maybe just to, and maybe we can't have this meeting offline, but you're talking more about the actual staff report itself and the packet and the different sections of that and what it means or? Yeah, and... It's it's sort of like when you said maybe I think you said it about you know not knowing what you don't know mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> I generally come into these looking at your recommendations and going well if if they think it's probably a good project then so do I um, I don't know the criteria upon which I would say well that's not really what we want I mean the comp comp plan for sure. Um, so again, this might just be a me issue. <laughs> I appreciate this, and, and this is 
part of the, again, dialogue, and I think this is good for all commissioners, don't feel pressured to know all the ins and outs of state code with LUPA and what you can and can't talk about or, or anything like that. Um, ask questions if you have questions. Really, you're here, though, because you are part of the community, and again, not to be derogatory in any way, but lay people. You're, you're just looking at a project going, does that fit? For, put the code aside, put the comp plan aside, just is that what we want in our community and yes it should be it needs to be when you get to a motion and the findings it needs to be based on the plans that we've adopted and the processes we have but a lot of what we're looking for is is fresh eyes that are just trying to evaluate the sniff test of a project for lack of a better way to explain it so you should be subject matter experts but really you're here because you're part of the community and a valued member of our community that can evaluate yes this project is right for our community or no it's not um, and we can train you up as much as you want but that's why we kind of put you up there with very little training to say y you're an individual share your thoughts and opinions on this don't get too caught up in the codes and the shalls and, sh and shall nots but at the end of the day yes we got to do that stuff still but it really is your, your opinion based in in some plans and facts so we can talk some more if you'd like but um, Again, I would say this to everyone. I, I appreciate um, y y your t your time and your effort, and just uh, if you're not comfortable doing it, I definitely want to get you there. But don't feel um, pressured to again have all of 67, 65 of Idaho Code memorized or the comp plan page. You know, section 3.14. It says this. Well, I can do rely on staff. We try to paraphrase it for you. Yeah, and I can. I mean. I'm the fourth chair in three years, so you know things happen pretty fast. But um, I mean, I had some really good people to learn from, and for the first year, probably, I mean, I didn't really make outside of an easy motion. I didn't really make a motion, so it took quite a while. I mean, for me to get comfortable interjecting and throwing in my own opinions, and you know, things like I never want to see a shared driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't there more open space or pathways? I mean, it took me a while to get comfortable in just, um, you know, iterating that in a public forum because, you know, you, you don't know what pe how people are going to react. You don't know the work that went into it. And the, I mean, the staff reports and, and the agency reports and stuff like that, that's kind of the roadway that we're going down. Um, between Bill and, and Kurt, th there are guardrails, you know. <laughs> the, they're going to let you know if we're kind of getting outside of the, you know, of, of where we should be going with, with different stuff. And, and um, you know, staff does a pretty good job of that as well. So, I mean, it's nice. And I made a, you know, a comment earlier that I like. Sometimes Sonia is very, she's very blunt about how she can present something, yes or no. And I, I like that. You know, I mean, it's, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I just, I generally do like that she's very black and white about some things. So, um, you know, and that, that all takes a while to get those relationships dialed in and to understand if people's, you know, different people's personalities, what's important to different people as they look at stuff and what's important to you, you know, as far as what you're trying to represent when you're up here as part of your community, you know, and, and the input that you get from community. So, um, I mean, it took me a year and a half to be comfortable in telling people that I was on planning and zoning. So. To, to be perfectly honest, I mean, nobody that I worked with even knew until recently that I was even on planning and zoning. So, um, you know, once that happens, look out because, you know, you're going to get a lot of a lot of questions um, coming in and through. So and Kurt, Kurt will cover how to how to handle some of those questions, I'm sure. But it's it's a learning process. And th these training sessions to me are valuable because. I mean, I remember when I first came through everything and, and some of the early um, meetings that we had and just feeling completely out of place for the most part. So um, it, gets, it does get more comfortable. It does, it does happen over time. It does take time in order to get there. I mean, I can tell you that from experience for sure. So, and again, you know, fourth chair in three years. So it happens faster than you think <laughs> in a lot of regards as well. So anyway. That's Mr. Chair, can I just add one one thing before, uh, just to your point, mm -hmm. if it's okay. Um, th this 
training session again. I, it was done on pretty short notice, holiday week. So that, don't think that this is how, I mean, the conversation back and forth I, I love, but it'll be a little more structured going forward and it will be, hopefully, uh, again, the idea is to get you all more comfortable. It is, you are a pretty young commission. Um, Mr. Yearsley, has, I've been working with him for, he left the room, so I don't know, four, 12, 14 years, 16 years, a while. Um, he's been around, but for the most part, it, this is the greenest commission we've had in since I've been here. Um, and that's not just why we're doing the training, but there is some thought to that too. Like, hey, we you know the, we we do lose a lot of that um, that knowledge base and and um, on the job training because everyone's learning at the same time. So, anyways, just wanted to somewhat apologize for this one not being a little more structured and covering a lot of meat. It's a little more. Um, but some things that I hope you find anyways that were, were helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep, really appreciate the the time to put, you know, to come out and talk and just start planning things out and, you know, get some get some communication happening as far as what's important, what we feel we need to learn and kind of start putting that on. So it'll be good. Thank you. Absolutely. So when you come up there, I feel like I need to ask you your name and address for the record. But <laughs> I'll, I'll start by uh, going off script immediately. But I thought that last five or ten minute discussion was super valuable. So I appreciate that question from Commissioner Grace, and I really appreciate that interaction. Um, so I, I think that's that's really valuable. And one thought I had: this may or may not be a good idea, but. Um, you mentioned Commissioner Yearsley having uh, extensive experience, or I guess Caleb did. Um, I think it'd be interesting for a commissioner or two, maybe the chairman and Commissioner Yearsley, to kind of take on that topic of saying, you know, hey, we've been doing this for a while, and when I get a packet, this is how I approach it. You know, this is how I prioritize, and I look at, you know, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. I think that would be really valuable, um, if not as part of a presentation, at least maybe a cup of coffee or, uh, you know, a lunch or something like that. So I think that's a, that was a wonderful question. And uh, I really appreciate that dialogue amongst the group. I think that was really valuable. So my topic is um, a little more dry. In fact, Caleb, I'm sure he did not intend to offend me, but he actually specifically referred to this as a, uh, as a dry topic. So I'm going to talk about <laughs> uh, when he was talking about sort of statewide topics and potential videos, and you mentioned quasi-judicial proceedings and related topics. So that's our, our last topic for today, and I'll try to keep it brief. But it's something you, you heard about when you first came onto the commission, and every now and again, it came up a couple, night, a couple times tonight, actually, as well, um, that, that term comes up, and another term that goes, fits closely with that quasi-judicial proceeding is due process. So you, you, you heard about that when you first came on the commission. You hear about that every now and again out of my mouth or from a planner or uh, others. Um, but I thought it'd be good for, for us to just spend maybe five to 10 minutes um, just to kind of cover that again. So the, I want to start, I guess, by saying that in terms of this body, but the city council and other uh, governing bodies that deal with these kind of issues, courts kind of look at that as you have sort of two, you fall in the, you know, the, the topics you work on fall in the two uh, kind of basic buckets, so to speak. So bucket one, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, is often referred to as legislative action. So that, when you're dealing with topics that have broad implications for the community that are not site specific, that are dealing with you know, issues that have, um, that impact you know, many people, many parcels and so forth, that's often going to fall in that legislative action bucket. So examples of that would be, we talked about two of these things tonight that I just took note of. One is the comprehensive plan. You're a recommending body to the city council on the, but that's a, the plan, that's, that's a plan that impacts the community as a whole, typically, particularly when we're updating a plan or doing a plan for the first time. But those, these are um, policies that impact the community as a whole, not necessarily a particular parcel A or parcel B or developer A or property owner C. So those um, fall into a different category. We have more latitude in both in terms of how the commission deals with those issues, how you take in information, how you talk to people. You have quite a bit of flexibility on legislative issues. The other bucket that courts talk about that we have less flexibility, so I'm going to spend my time talking about that tonight, are, is that term I referred to earlier about quasi-judicial proceedings. So quasi-judicial proceedings, a kind of a way, a way to think about that is sort of court light or you know, something of that nature. So essentially, 
So the word quasi meaning similar to, so it's similar to judicial or court proceedings. And you all, I'm not sure if you thought about yourself in this way, but in some ways you're sitting as uh, judges on these applications and you're making decisions that are impacting people's property rights. Because of that, so these are decisions that are site specific and they're individual specific and they're, imp they're impacting potentially people's back pockets, right? Their, their bottom line. So that triggers constitutional concerns that we all need to be aware of, and that's where those concerns about due process and these types of quasi-judicial proceedings come into play. So under both the United States Constitution and the Idaho Constitution, there are protections against the deprivation of property rights, of property value. Um, and so what the courts have said is that these types of proceedings that you all deal with, conditional use permits, um, and related uh, decisions that you make, these fall, all those kind of decisions fall into that category of protection under the Constitution. That people that are before you have a right to due process. And I'll just describe that a little bit in a moment. I'll put some more meat on the bones for you. But essentially, for constitutional reasons, so it doesn't matter what state law says, what other laws might come into play, like conflict of interest laws or open meeting laws and things of that nature, those all are applicable as well. We might talk about those at a future training, but today the issue is notwithstanding all these specific laws that may be on the book, on the books, we have the U.S. Constitution and the Idaho Constitution, and the U.S. Constitution in particular is going to trump everything else. Right? So we have to adhere to the due process provisions of the 14th Amendment and by extension the Fifth Amendment. So that's the importance of quasi-judicial uh, proceedings is that you all have special obligations to make sure we have fair processes, that people have a say in what happens, and that we treat everybody equally, and that everybody has an opportunity to participate and have their voice heard. Um, when I talk about due process, the courts typically focus on kind of three areas or subtopics under that umbrella, pardon me, umbrella of due process. The first is notice, so people have to be aware that you're making a decision that might impact them. So you have the applicant, which is someone who's, his, that's, that's the reason the topic's before you, but uh, adjoining uh, property owners, members of the community, uh, whoever, whomever may have an interest in that topic, all have a right to notice about what is happening and how that might impact them. Uh, so that's part of that due process um, discussion. The next is the opportunity to be heard in a meaningful way, so that they have an opportunity to share their views. They may. You know, in the case of an application, may agree with an applicant, may disagree, may have supplemental information, want to see some tweaks or changes, but people have to have a meaningful opportunity to participate and to be heard. And then lastly, and this is what's really critical for each of you as commissioners, is that they have a constitutional right to have a neutral, a neutral decision maker. It means you have to come to a meeting with an open mind, and you have to listen to all sides and take in all information and be fair about that and then you know, arrive at a reasoned decision that's fair to all, that takes all that into consideration. So those are important things. Notice an opportunity for individuals, concerned uh, parties to be heard, and importantly for you all sitting as quasi-judges is that you are neutral decision makers that are making judgments based upon the facts before you. I'll elaborate on that in a moment as well. So the three particular topics I want to talk to you about tonight under that umbrella of neutrality, I guess, or being neutral decision makers. And so I'm going to talk about, I'll list them and I'll dive a little deeper into each, but one is uh, bias, a second is ex parte communications, which Caleb touched upon a few minutes ago, or just mentioned, and then lastly, site visits and other independent research, um, and how that comes into play as well. So with regard to bias, we have laws in the book that deal with financial conflicts and other types of conflicts, and you all have had a little bit of a, an overview of that as, you, on your, as part of your onboarding process. In this context, for due process, what courts have basically said, again, right, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, applicants and other stakeholders, others that have an interest, have, have a constitutional right to a neutral decision maker. So you need to come to a meeting with an open mind and be able to take information in. There are court cases where you know, commissioners or city council members or other um, government officials, for example, have made comments, say, before a meeting. Maybe a good example actually is where like, uh, a council member shows up at a planning and zoning commission meeting, makes negative comments, actually testifies, or some other, other ways comments on a, 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 an application before the planning and zoning commission, it makes it maybe uh, a, you know, opposed to the project. 
Then that issue comes before the city council later for action. You know, courts have said, you know, that council member cannot participate. You've already poisoned the well. You've tainted the well because you've already indicated you have a bias. You know, you have statements that uh, clearly indicate that you are opposed to the project. How can you be a neutral decision maker? So uh, importantly, it's uh, you know that, that we come to a meeting with you know, open minds and taking the information, make the best decisions we can. So fair process, no pre preconceived uh, views or prejudices. Um, it is okay. Courts have said it's okay for you to rely upon your experience and your common sense. And as Caleb said in a different context, that's really a big role that you play as you are members of the community and you bring a community perspective to the discussion and to ultimately to the decision. So you don't have to um, put aside your experiences or your, uh, what you know about your community and as an, as an involved community member. Um, so the courts have never said you have to go that far. They don't expect that type of impartiality that you can bring your experience and your, um, those types of issues to the table. But you need to come, you know, again, with an open mind and being willing to listen. Um, I'm going to transition into ex parte communications. So ex parte communication essentially is, you know, we have, uh, in, I'll just we use uh, Planning and Zoning Commission as our example, you know, as a, one or more commissioners, you have uh, individuals, applicants, community stakeholders, other property owners that have an interest in a topic. And the idea is we want to have everybody here and deal with the information at the same time so it's a fair and level playing field. Ex parte communications happens when say, you know, the applicant has a discussion with one or more of you, but others are not there to hear the benefit of that conversation, and importantly, they're not there to rebut or to provide other context, right? And so that creates a due process issue in that uh, you as a decision maker are hearing one side of the story, not the full story, and also these individuals that aren't part of that ex parte communication they, don't, they didn't have notice of that discussion. They didn't have an opportunity to be heard, to you know, put their view, uh, to have their view expressed to you as a commissioner, as a decision maker. And so ex parte communications you know, really ought to be avoided. There, there are some cures for that. There's, the reality is it happens. And sometimes it happens before you know it. <laughs> You're already into a conversation and you know, it dawns on you halfway through, or maybe it's not clear until halfway through that this might be a potential problem. So, my first advice to you is best practice, avoid ex parte communications, just as Commissioner Seal was talking about with maybe some of his coworkers and colleagues. You know, avoid those discussions, that's best practice. But from a legal perspective, it can be cured. So if, you, uh, if, that, if something does occur, it can be cured. But the cure is a bit awkward, and the awkwardness is basically as you, as a commissioner, you need to disclose that ex parte communication. So now the issue is before the commission as a whole. Um, you would need to, in order to cure that problem and to cure the due process concern, you need to disclose that ex, ex parte communication and you need to provide a meaningful description of what happened, what was discussed. So you don't have to give the blow by blow, you don't need to have a transcript or a recording, but you have to give uh, other stakeholders a good sense of what transpired and the reason for that is that so those individuals others have a chance to get their voice heard and to rebut perhaps what was said uh, during those ex parte communications so in summary you know my advice is uh, avoid those situations whenever possible that's the best practice in those instances where something happens inadvertently or just you know that's just how life works sometimes uh, it's important that you get on the record as soon as practicable and you know, disclose that, describe the content of what occurred, um, and get that out there. And that, from a legal perspective, does cure the issue from, uh, in terms of future legal challenges, but it's, a, it's an awkward type process, so best to avoid it altogether. Mr. Chair? Yep. Can, can you, um, with that, what is considered an ex parte communication? Um, you know, is it like, your neighbor comes and asks about the project that's happening across the street. Is that considered an ex parte communication? Help, help us understand, because I think there's a lot of individuals just not quite sure what, what, what consists of that, so. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Yearsley. So I would, uh, and I, I'm gonna sort of preface my comment that I tend to be more conservative maybe than others, so, um, uh, I'll just preface my comments that way, but particularly the way you described that scenario, we have a neighbor and there's a project across the street. I think you said something to that effect. So yeah. clearly that neighbor has an interest in what is happening there. I would say that's ex parte communication and I would uh, try to 
avoid that discussion and just explain your situation. I think it's, I think most people can appreciate it if you just take about one minute to say, you know, I'm a member of the Plank and Zoning Commission. This is going to be before us shortly, and in order to be fair to all and to comply with the law, I really can't talk about that. I apologize, but you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you please, you know, you, you can you give your comments in writing. Please show up at the meeting. I'd like to hear from you. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say, but everybody has to hear it at the same time. So does that make sense? It does, and that's how I've handled it, is just to let people know that there's a public hearing process, given the links to you know, where they can find that information at and, and uh, where the public record is as well. Because a lot of people don't, they want to talk to an individual because they don't understand that process. They don't know where that information lives. So that's been incredibly helpful to me in, in situations like that. And um, I think that's a great approach, and I like the thought that came up earlier is, in addition to all that, feel free to, uh, I think, you know, best, you know, kind of a first step was, you know, here's where you can access resources. Please come to the meeting. We want to hear from you. But also, if you have additional questions, there are, you know, professional planning staff that work for our community that, that know the details and can talk to you and are willing to answer questions you might have. So that's certainly appropriate to say. Um, I want to reinforce something Caleb mentioned earlier as well is that, for you as commissioners, you're always welcome to contact city staff. That's not ex parte communication because city staff, we're not, we're not interested parties in the sense that we have you know, property ownership or property values or an interest that would be impacted by your decision. We're here to help you. We are here to support you. So you're always welcome to contact um, the planning staff and we're always willing to, to help you out on that score. Mr. Chair. And Kurt, can I, I just add one more thing yeah. real quick? Go ahead. Uh, and I, I was going to say that, yes, send them to if your neighbor, whatever, planning staff, absolutely. I would also just say there, it, it is, don't get intimidated by some of what Kurt's saying. And I think just simply when I like your best practices to avoid ex parte, that's, that's the best practice. But if you're like, oh, I think I may have just had a conversation that may, when in doubt, contact Kurt and he can you can tell him what happened he can advise you hey yep I think you need to cure this on the record or nope that's not a concern we're, we're good to go he's got your best interest as well as the city's best interest in mind so feel free to just run that scenario by him oh just you know even in retrospect you know what? I talked to my neighbor and that I didn't even know that was on the agenda when I talked to him do I need to tell them do I need to disclose that on the record Kurt just ask him he'll tell you yep this is are you good or nope you're we need to cure this so uh, that's great advice I'm, I'm happy to have those discussions so feel free, free to stop by call email I'm, I'm uh, easily available so yeah, I'm happy to have that discussion the other thing I'll say is that um, in terms of ex parte communications we're talking about substantive topics not procedural type things so you know if a neighbor wants to know when is that commission meeting or you know what's the email address to send a comment in that's all fair game so procedural issues that's not that's a different topic and you're not there's no preclusion in terms of, you know, you're not precluded from discussing those type of topics. It's the substantive nature of the application or the issue that's gonna be before you. So my last topic area then is um, site visits or sometimes what the courts have referred to as views or on-site views. And this is changing with technology. So I'm gonna kind of talk about what the courts have done first and then there's the evolving area of law that dealing with kind of uh, the logical extension of what we've seen in the past. But I'll say, I'll start with in terms of there's a just it's just human nature. I'm guilty of this, and I suspect others may be. Uh, certainly, there's lots of cases that would demonstrate that's true. <laughs> that you feel like you want to just go kick the tires, right? You read a staff report, or you're hearing about a project, and I just really want to go look at it. I want to go out to the site, and I want to go kick the tires a little bit. Very understandable. I would advise you not to do so, however. And it's back to... There is a cure for this as well, but I think a best practice is, you know, your, your really role, what the courts have said is you really, you are a, a judicial type or a quasi-judicial type body. You really need to rely upon the record that is before you. You need to rely upon what the applicant submits, what you hear from the community, what you hear from staff, questions that you ask, responses that you receive, any information that you get on the record, but really your role is to look at the record that is before you and make a decision. So you really need to kind of fight that human instinct to go do your independent research and go, you know, go out and kick the tires at the site and so forth. The courts have, have essentially said that that's a due process violation because, you know, particularly when it's more than one commissioner, but I think an argument is there even if it's a single commissioner, but definitely if it's a body or a, a subgroup of the commission, if you go into that site, 
So we're missing, we're missing a couple of steps in our due process procedure, right? So the applicant or neighbors or other interested parties, they don't have notice, so they don't know you're there and they may want to, to know about it, number one, and they, importantly, they don't have an opportunity to be heard, right? So you're at the site and you're kicking the tires, um, but those that have an interest in the topic, they like to be there because they want to give you their two cents, right? This is what you ought to be looking at and this is why that doesn't look the way it ought to look, um, but they don't have that opportunity, so they don't have notice, they don't have an opportunity to be heard. So my advice to you is to refrain from on-site visits, um, and I'm gonna expand on that thought in a moment, and really rely upon the records before you. And it's perfectly fine, uh, the planning staff and the city in general, if you need more information, you want more material, you have additional questions, uh, we are very happy to accommodate that. So just ask, and we're happy to do so. But try to refrain from visiting sites directly. And now I'm gonna transition, transition that discussion to today's modern world where we all have, you know, um, a zillion resources in our pocket with our smartphone and Google Maps and internet searches about different applicants and companies and what they do and what they did elsewhere and what does a Costco look like in Colorado and all these kind. Of, we get, actually, that's a the time permits, I'll give you a war story about Costco. That was part of our litigation on Costco that, that came back to bite us. We prevailed on the bigger picture, but that was a problem. Um, so my, in, for the, all the same reasons that I, I would recommend you not go to the site and kick the tires, um, you really need to rely upon the records before you. And so I would really encourage you to not do independent research, either before a meeting or definitely, definitely on the dais, in terms of Google map searches, internet searches, you know, I wanna know more about this company, this applicant, this person is speaking, I wanna know what that person's uh, LinkedIn uh, material says. Uh, refrain from doing that, um, if you, you know, uh, that would be my recommendation to you. But if you want to know any of that type of stuff, like I had, I, really, I would really like to see the Google map or an aerial, you know, an aerial photo, or I wanna you know, see X or Y, um, staff is almost always able to accommodate that. So feel free to do that. You say, you know, I'd, I'd like to take a look at an aerial map of this area and be able to, to understand how this all connects and so forth. That's all very much fair game, but it gets more dicey when individuals, individual commissioners start doing independent research because really, again, you're sitting as a judge in many ways and your job is to look at the record before you that others are presenting to you. You're not your task is not to go create the evidence, you're to evaluate the evidence that's being presented to you. That makes sense? Okay. All right, well that's my preaching for tonight. So <laughs> uh, I'm gonna leave it at that, but you know, in, in summary, I think just, you know, just use your good judgment on that type of thing. Um, I think follow best practices. If, if there's a question, definitely give me a call, as Caleb suggested, talk with the planning staff, and we're always willing to um, you know, provide additional information or help you answer questions that you might have. Just, uh, let's just, you know, the best practices, just do it all in a public forum where everybody sees it, hears it, has a chance to rebut, and then there's no questions about due, uh, about due process violations. Everybody's, it's nice and clean. I will tell you the Costco story real quick because it's, it didn't, it didn't kill us, but, uh, you know, one of the issues we had there, I won't name council members to protect the innocent or guilty, <laughs> but we had a council member during that, co during the Costco project that, you know, was looking up things uh, on the internet during that, that hearing and was made a few comments on the record about, well, I'm looking at a Costco in Colorado that has this architecture. I'm looking at a Costco in California that has that architecture. Um, ultimately, the individuals that challenged the city's decision on that, that's one of the things they latched onto, was this is a due process violation, is that, you know, there's extraneous information that's being considered here that we weren't privy to, and um, that became one of the litigation topics that we had to deal with as we were, you know, making our case before a judge. So it does come back to, to bite us sometimes in the real world. Uh, that one had a happy ending, the city ultimately prevailed, but it's just, it was an issue that we had to uh, uh, defend that would have been nicer not to have to deal with it. Mr. Chair? Go right ahead. Um, thanks again for the, for the training. I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question when it comes down to what we can look at on our screens. Mm -hmm. So can I go to the file folder and pull up things like the application request, elevations, geotech, legals, things like that during the hearing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Wheeler. Great question, and that's 100% fair game. So that's all information that's, that's in the file, in the record. 
Uh, that's material that's available to you, but it's also available to the applicant, to stakeholders, adjacent property owners. Everybody has access to it, and so that's all fair game. You're welcome to, uh, you know, so I know over time we've had some commissioners like to print off staff reports and background material. Other commissioners have a preference for uh, using the computer and doing it electronically. Both ways work, and you're very much welcome to uh, access all those records during your deliberations. Mr. Chairman. Right ahead. Um, Kurt, is there, a, is there a, a line of demarcation in terms of when we know we're going to get something before us? For example, I think there's an In-N-Out burger coming at some point. Sure. There's, there's stories in the newspaper about it. Um, but there's nothing substantive before us, or, yep. but eventually there probably will be. I mean, is there, a, is there a line of demarcation as to when this would kick in? That is a, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Grace, excellent question. So the line that is clear, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand on my thought, but the line that is clear is once, once an application has been submitted, once it's in queue, that is definitely a bright line. And so once that, that occurs, um, clearly everything we just talked about comes into play. The part that is um, less clear is, you know, the, just as the example you're talking about, you know, what happens prior to the submission of application. In Idaho, there's no good case law on that topic, so it is yet to be decided. Um, my advice would be, uh, if you are aware that a project is, is forthcoming, um, but you're not sure that an application has, has been submitted yet, or um, maybe it even hasn't been submitted, but you're confident that it will be, I think a best practice would be to use caution in that and you apply all the same rules. Um, if you do choose to meet with somebody in advance, you know, take records of what, of what was discussed, you know, uh, the date and time of the discussion and a brief summary so that if it does ultimately come before you as a commissioner in a hearing context, you can at least um, cure the record by uh, disclosing that. I met with this developer uh, on this date and we had a brief conversation about X and Y and Z. Um, now I'll say, that I'll, in that part of the discussion, just like I started, there is no Idaho case law on that. Uh, other states have kind of come to that conclusion, but Idaho is, uh, that's not been litigated yet. But um, clearly the, the, the bright line is once the application is submitted, anything from that point going forward is, uh, you know, definitely apply the rules we just talked about. Thanks. Mr. Chair. Caleb again. Can, I, can I just expand on that a little bit? Um, and not to be a broken record, but again, you can contact staff. And as an example, in and out, you won't hear. That's a principally permitted use. We can talk about it. They've got their certificate of zoning compliance. You guys will not have to see that one. So if you're concerned about that or even just curious about it, again, contact staff and we can um, likely uh, answer your question. In the past, um, Mr. Neri, you know, if a project's eminent, probably shouldn't talk about it. From time to time, it hasn't happened for several years that I can recall, um, certainly not with the Planning and Zoning Commission anyways. We will get someone that is speculating on some property and goes, you know what, I've heard that commissioner has a problem with the amount of open space. And from time to time, we may say, you know, before they've acquired the property, they're just trying to kind of do some due diligence. You can go talk with them. That's okay. It's not an eminent application. They're trying to understand the risks and if they should go forward. So. There isn't a bright line there, but if it's an imminent, if they've pre apped with us and they're getting towards and it's the day before they intend to submit and now they're polling you all, try to avoid those types. And you don't know that that's their intention, but a lot of times you can, or again, you can contact staff, hey, have you met with these folks? Do you know who this is? Uh, sometimes we have, sometimes we haven't, but we can even maybe make that line a little bit brighter for you or share what we know anyways and say, yep, they, they're pretty serious. We anticipate an application in the next couple of weeks or no, I, I, you know, they, we, we told them to talk to you because we knew you had concerns about that. And so we directed them to, we don't do that. Again, we don't do that very often. Um, you'd probably hear from us if we say, hey, we're sending them your way because we know you have a problem with parking for multifamily. So we said, go talk to the commission about it. Um, again, very, very rare. Um, but anyways, just, yeah, uh, there, there are times there are times in lives where your other roles in the community will come into play as well. So, for for me personally, I had some interactions with John Wardle on basically building a bike park or making bike extensions in parts of subdivisions that they were you know that they had going. So that those conversations are things that if if anything about those were ever to come before the commission, then I would. have 
you know, had to disclose those conversations because I was the president of the Idaho BMX Association at that point in time. So that's part of my job is to have those conversations with people like that, knowing that this is, could be in conflict with, you know, what we hear up here. So luckily, nothing like that ever, you know, those two paths never really crossed. But it can happen, and, it's, and it can legitimately happen. So just something to be aware of. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. It also doesn't help that our news publication and our news outlets are provo pro provide provocative headlines. Like today, the statesman said, you know, this this piece of dirt next to the village is going to have, you know, ten thousand new people or something to that effect. Or the articles about in and outs coming. You know, it's it's in our as like you said as as citizens, it's going to be in front of us. And if they know that we're commissioners, they're like, oh well, what do you what do you think? Like well, provide public testimony, and <laughs> but um, but it, it, reading the newspapers or listening to the radio, it's going to be part of our everyday life as citizens as well. So, yep. yeah, I think that's a fair comment. So, a couple thoughts that that sparked for me. So, you know, one is you you know all residents of the community, you uh, and you're active and engaged residents, and so yeah, you're expected to read the newspaper, listen to the you know the news and that type of thing, and we'd encourage you to do so. That's not a problem at all. You know, the issue is more so no no problem in that regard. Um, you know, the issue really is is more substantive conversations with a particular individual that might be in front of you you know as part of an application approval process. So that those are the those are the you know, issues that we need to be mindful of. So oh, um, well, that's kind of the gist. Uh, you know, again, I, I appreciate Caleb's comment. There, you, if you ever have a question about, it's one of these things you can talk about in the abstract, but you know, until you actually kind of deal with a real issue, it's, it doesn't become um, it becomes more concrete when you have a real issue. So, uh, you know, if and when that day comes for you, uh, feel free to, to reach out. I'm happy to chat with you about that, um, Caleb, other planning staff. So we're we're always uh, happy to assist. But I just want to sort of uh, take the opportunity tonight to kind of recover some of those to recover that topic, I guess, in the sense of the importance of that term of quasi-judicial proceedings and why it's important, because we have constitutional provisions that trump everything else and can become topics in litigation and have for Meridian in particular. We've had issues like that that have become you know, one of uh, many uh, different arguments during litigation. So we try to be, uh, you know, play by the rules and we try to uh, sort of nip those things in the bud before they become a problem. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, I think that was the end of what we're providing here for training tonight, so I will take one more motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move we adjourn. Second. It's been moved we adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate all that. That was kind of really nice.